Jerry, thank you for joining us. How you doing? Well, thank you for having me and, and giving me a chance to talk about my friend. Um, you met him in 1960 in Rome. Did you guys instantly have a connection? No, zero. Uh, he was a curiosity to me. I mean, I was over there. I didn't care who won the light heavyweight gold medal. It doesn't matter anyway. But I saw him sitting on the steps somewhere in the Olympic Village, and he had the gold medal on. He was hollering at everybody, and all these athletes were walking by. And most of them couldn't understand English, and he's yelling, I'm the best. I'm going to, you watch. I'm going to win. But the thing that attracted me was every time a female athlete passed, she always paused and looked back over her shoulder. I said, well, this guy, for one reason or another, is worth watching. Now, this is at a time, because right now, Jerry, right, somebody's screaming, I'm the greatest, you don't bat an eye. But what was it like to have uh, an athlete like that have that kind of confidence? Well, it, 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 look, everything changed in our relationship uh, later on. But in the beginning, it was, you know, fun and good times. Uh, he used to call me on the phone. I had no interest in seeing him fight much. And uh, Charlie Powell, he was going to fight an ex-football player named Charlie Powell in Pittsburgh. And he calls me up and he says, uh, uh, you got to come, you got to come. This boy, Ed Dyke, you put him up to it. you, you got to come, you got to come. This is the thing. I'll knock him out, too. And I'll, I said, you know, I don't even like to stop for gas in Pittsburgh, you know. <laughs> and you're fighting a football player. you got to be kidding me. But I got very interested after the Doug Challenge fight. Um, he really, I thought he lost that fight. But it was so subjective, I couldn't complain because it was so close. It was either way. He goes to England, and he's going to fight Henry Cooper and, of course, he gets knocked on his ass, and then he gets up and he and he wins the fight. And now I'm really interested. And then after that, I'm starting to hang around, and we go out there. We're all out, a bunch of us, right, to Denver, and he's going to challenge Sonny Liston on his lawn, and of course, he moved in. The neighbors were all looking, Sonny's furious. And everything turned around when I saw his performance. And I liked him. I liked him. I did not think he had a snowball's chance in hell to beat Sonny Liston. And... He came to the way in, and everybody remembers the way he carried on and screamed. He had the African walking stick. He's banging on the ground. Bring out that bear. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And then the commission doctor, of course, plays as part of the charade. He says, why his blood pressure has gone through the roof, and his heartbeat is, is faster than a normal man. And then I get in a car. I'm driving back to my hotel. I hear, well, uh, I hear that Cassius Clay was seen at the airport trying to book a flight out of the country, and, and we're going to check on it. I'm saying, what the hell is going on here? And then I go to the flight, and in early, maybe first or second flight of the evening, uh, Rachman Ali, his brother, is fighting. And I hear this voice saying, pick your hand up, pick your hand up. I said, move over there, right? Okay, now, you know, I'm like, okay, now, go inside. And I'm looking, and it's Allie in a sports shirt standing in the aisle, giving advice to his brother. I'm saying, boy, this guy must be worried stiff, right? <laughs> and, and I realized, hey, maybe he fooled me. And he sure did that evening, I got to say that. He, he seems like, you know, from the outside looking in, Jerry, I read your column on Sunday, which I thought was brilliant and really opened up so many areas to talk about. He, he seemed very complex. So he you, was. You, 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 know, you portrayed a giving, loving man. And then, I mean, he was very mean-spirited to Joe Frazier, very mean to, to Floyd Patterson in the ring. Was it hard to reconcile all those aspects of his life? Well, you forgot one of the worst meannesses of all, and that was uh, Ernie Terrell. What's my name? What's my name? What's my name? Right. And and uh, it, it, you had yeah, it's a very difficult thing. First of all, I used to ask myself, "Am I liking this guy because I want to like him?" Is that what this is all about? But it was really was. He was a different person in the ring. Like I, it, you know, you don't see any Harvard fellows saying, "I think I'll try heavyweight boxing for a while until I get hit in the head." I mean, it takes a certain persona during the fight to be who you are. Uh, no, I didn't have any trouble with that because by then we knew each other and I was deeply involved in his conscientious objector thing. Uh, most people don't know this. Uh, to be a conscientious objector, the government appoints someone to examine you. He's called the examiner, interestingly enough. And he takes you in a closed room and when he comes out he will say he is or he is. The FBI submits a report, but to my knowledge, and no one has disproved this to me at all, there's never been or if there is, it happened in, in, in the woods somewhere. There's never been a case where the FBI report overrules the examiner. Walter Grauman, or I think his first name was Walter, his last name was Grauman, G-R-A-U-M-E-N. He was a retired Republican judge, and they picked him for a reason. He lived in Louisville, and 
you know, he was conservative and whatever else. This comes out and he says, this man's a conscientious objector. They overrule him using the FBI report, which is very vague, because obviously the word is he's got to go. And interestingly enough, I'm on a Dick Cavett show, and I'm telling this story, and I'm saying, I don't know what happened to, or, or to Mr. Judge Grauman, but I'm sure it wasn't good in his hometown. Bing, the producer runs out going, cut, 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 you know, of course, his throat with his hand. They cut, commercial. The guy says, he, the kid's on the phone. His son's on the phone. He wants to talk to Jerry. So they hook it up, which is a television actor's dream. And he's saying to me, you have it exactly right. You have it exactly right. They turned their backs on him. They made him an outcast. They ruined him. Well, anyway, years later, when he gets it, you know, most people think, I don't know whether you knew or not, Michael, he never won in the Supreme Court. Did you know that? No, I did not. Okay, well, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to educate your listeners. He gets, he gets finally, he fights, he, he fights Frazier for the title, he fights, yeah, and he's still, you know, it's going through the court so he can fight. Uh, at that point, and then before the conspiracy starts, and so he finally gets to the Supreme Court, if he hadn't had a fight in so long, or whatever else. So he, it's, it's, it, it's up to, uh, um, Oh God, I'm having trouble with name. But the guy who was a lawyer in the in the in the uh, uh, Brown versus Speaker Board of Education and David Marshall, right? He, he's a justice, and he was on the in the in the Justice Department in a high capacity when the Alley case started. So he must recuse himself. So now you got a four-four court, right? We got eight judges. Well, they vote. It's five-three. He goes to jail. And Judge, Justice Harlan's law clerk, very bright young guy, I don't know who it was, which I did, goes in and says, Justice Harlan, I, I don't want to be out of line here, but two things I want to tell you. Did you know that the judge really said he was a conscientious objector? And also, here's some literature on his feelings about religion and uh, the nation of Islam. Harlan, there's another conference, and Harlan says, I'm changing my vote. He doesn't belong in jail. Now it's 4-4, but he still goes to jail in a 4-4 court because there's no decision, which means they refuse to hear it. They don't publish 4-4 decisions. So at that point, Justice Stewart, who says, listen, does anybody in this room really think she belongs in jail? And no, well, that's not the issue. We can't create precedent. We can't. He said, well, I'm going to get you all off the hook. Read the FBI, FBI report. It says this, 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 but it never says this is the reason. So what we do is we throw it out as a trial error. He walks, we don't set a precedent. And that's how the Supreme Court wow. case is dissolved. 